Now, welcome back to this final installment of our series of conversations around the aesthetics of resistance. So this is the final day of the School of Resistance. So hopefully we will all be graduating tonight. I'm not entirely sure, but we'll see. Uh, I'm joined again by the director Milo Rao, as well as the French writer and actor, uh, Edouard Louis, and the French philosopher and sociologist, Geoffroy de la Gannerie. Now, so far we've already covered a lot of ground over the past two days. Um, but this session was, we wanted to focus on the aesthetics of socially engaged arts. So our purpose today will be to explore the ways in which arts may be defined as socially engaged today. Um, now, perhaps we could start with you, Geoffroy, because we ended the conversation with you yesterday. And I wanted to ask you, you've written about this, about what the principles of socially engaged art might be today, what qualifies or does not qualify, in your opinion, as political arts. Could you perhaps give us, perhaps say a few words about what those principles might be for you today in the 21st century? Yes, hello, uh, thank you very much. Yes, it's it's true, but um, first, uh, um, uh, perhaps I want to, as, a, as you say, I want to say that every art is engaged every artist politically engaged is engaged in the conservation or, or in the transformation of uh, cultural structures social structures mm -hmm. economic structures mm -hmm. i don't know so it's very hard for me to say what is the aesthetics of a political uh, politically engaged art uh, because every art has to be seen as political and it's true that in the the social world we have a tendency to depoliticize the right or depoliticize the conservative forces and uh, always say that the left is politics but the right is politics too the right is engaged too the right is committed too and everything is politics when you do art but i think perhaps one uh, question we can ask too and perhaps to be more radical so we can uh, elaborate on some principles for uh, an art that would be ethics as i as i call it in my book la impossible but one of the questions i i ask is uh, uh, when we think about politics, perhaps we can too uh, uh, address the idea that is art uh, necessary if we want to do politics? Why art is necessary? And isn't there, uh, a, can't we uh, sometimes identify an antagonism? between an uh, artistic project and a politically pro uh, engaged project when you want to change a society. You know, I quote in my book, Lara Possible, the very uh, important uh, idea about uh, Herbert Marcuse, when he says that uh, artists are people who tend to, to adhere to the idea that we want another society, they want to negate the real in order to produce something different, in order to produce another idea of the world. But uh, differently with uh, activists or theoreticians, they don't do that in the, the reality. They don't do that in the real world. They do that in the real the realm of the imaginary. And so he says that in fact there is a kind of a, a grief of the political ambition at stake in the artistic impulse. And when you want to do art, in fact, sometimes you you can say you you renounce to uh, do, do revolution. And uh, Marcus says uh, doing art is, is in fact not doing revolution, is maintaining the project of a utopian society, but without acting really to transform the society. And so you can argue that in fact, um, there is a contradiction between the logic of uh, political action and the logic of aesthetics. And that's why for me, I, I would say that uh, uh, my question would be, uh, is there a plus-value plus -value, uh, in art when you want to do politics, or is it is it possible to legitimate an, arti an artistic practice by a political goal? And uh, on the contrary, can't you always argue that when you want to do politics, you can always do it better without art, or you can do it without recourse to aesthetics? And so, perhaps for me, uh, it is implicit of our three discussions that we need art, that we have to articulate art and politics, that we have to do art politically engaged. And perhaps the question we can ask is, is it real? Is it true? And do we really need, we really need art to do um, politics? Now, perhaps Edouard, you want to react because Geoffroy mentions that sense of grief that might come with, with the act of, of making art, of writing, in your case, of perhaps of being on stage. Is that something that you recognize or would you put it differently? Something uh, true in what Geoffroy says and something I completely disagree with. Uh, there, is, there is obviously this, this, this feeling of, of, of mourning uh, and of grief when you when you write when you write a book when you write a piece of art, because you know that you are not achieving a transformation that you could achieve in like uh, going to the streets, uh, helping homeless people, uh, demonstrating, uh, 
uh, taking a boat and helping migrants who are do, who dying in the Mediterranean, like Cédric Eru did, and this kind of thing. So it's true that there is this this constant feeling of of, of shame when you when you when you don't like the world you live in. At the moment you are writing, you 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 know that you could do something more and something more efficient right now. And this is true that for me it's important to write with this feeling of shame and to use, to use this shame as a as a tool in order to be constantly uh, confronted by the world and by the society uh, as an artist and not try to get rid of this shame but really to use it in order to make the least unethical art possible <laughs> but at the same time <laughs> At the same time, I, I, I disagree with Geoffroy because, uh, as we said, uh, uh, we were discussing yesterday and before yesterday, there are uh, several levels of an individual and several levels of transformation. And um, as a political subject, I want the ability to be transformed at all those levels, you know. And clearly, there are some transformations that a book will never achieve. I don't think a novel will destroy the class society, for example, right? I don't think a novel will do it. Uh, Le Manifeste du Parti du Communiste from Karl Marx almost did it, but I don't think a novel will, did it, will do it. Um, but um, at the same time, you know, there are, there are things that, uh, that, 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 that a, a, a social movement will never achieve either, you know? This feeling of, for example, as I was saying before yesterday, this feeling of building yourse yourself as a gay person when, when you watch a movie of Gus Van Sant or when you watch a movie of uh, Pedro Almodovar or when you watch, you know, a movie uh, uh, that is like portraying the life and the desire and, um, and, 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 the, and the happiness and the suffering of, of, of the person you want to become, of the person you are. And that you want to become, and you know, I, I've been kind of challenged by the time we have been going through with the pandemic on what is transformative, what is necessary, what is uh, important for an individual. You know, during this pandemic that we will probably talk one day into books of history, there were supermarkets that were that were open, for example, and you had government saying to the people, uh, you can buy food there. But you cannot buy, uh, I don't know, like lipstick in the supermarket, you know? And so how could the state define for us what is more important for us, what is more transformative for us, what is more essential for us? And sometimes heart is bringing this possibility of transformation that is not, you know, socially considered as something important, but that can be at an individual, at, a, at an individual level something extremely important and they are like this 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 possibility of creating yourself and of of, of self reinventing yourself that you that you encounter in front of a piece of art that uh, that that a social movement will not necessarily bring you and 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 i want this i want those two possibilities to happen at the same time and a world in which you can only change the social gender justice or the social class justice or the racial justice, uh, but a world in which you cannot uh, recognize your melancholy in someone else, in, 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 in which you cannot recognize your uh, loss of a loved one, in which you cannot recognize your urge to dance, for example. It's not, it's not a society that I want to live in. So clearly there are a, a, a transformation that art and literature will never, once again, uh, will we, we'll never, will never bring, will never create, and this is a problem for her. This is a, this is a missing part of her. But this, there are all, also all these, all these things that we, that, 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 that we can, that we can change, and uh, that are part of an individual too. And I think, I, I think that it's, uh, it's like, it's like, it's like different yeah different fragments of a being you know uh, a book will not give you what uh, love gives you love will not give you what uh, uh, politics gives you sexuality will not give you what music will give you but uh, I, I i wonder if it's possible to create a, a kind of a cartography of, of 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 the possibility of changing in which art would be a part and and politics would be a part also but without uh, dismissing each other in using in using the other and 
And but 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 I know there is a tension here. There is a tension because it's it's also the way that uh, bourgeois arts define himself, you know, define itself and defend itself in saying we can talk about wherever you want. And at the end, it justifies the bourgeoisie writing books for decades again and again about their little bourgeois life in the theater. Uh, getting divorced and losing their bicycle and being traumatized by that. And they say, this is the right I have because I am, I, I have multiplicity within me. So I know there is a tension here. I know it's not, it's not easy, but I don't think that it's something that we can dismiss like I think Joffre was doing in a way. I think there is, there is something in between in, in, that is, that, that is what we can, we can find. And I think uh, the things that we can find in, 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 in talking together today, but clearly. Mm -hmm. uh, Milo, I'm sure there's, there's a lot in there that you want to react to, but perhaps just one question to, to start. Uh, Edouard mentioned the time that we're going through, and of course, we're still very much in the middle of it. But has the pandemic affected your way of thinking about your work in, in some ways? Or are you at least considering <laughs> some, some ways in which to move forward based on what we've been going through? Yeah, I mean, that's a question we, I think we all answered many, many times in the last weeks and months. And uh, I think new things came to us, new medias became important. We, for example, this discussion became, became possible and we just do it. So uh, as I joined many, many, and everybody of us, many discussions like this that were somehow impossible before, even if the technology was there. So we kind of uh, found out that we can do that at any moment. And I think these kind of relations are quite interesting. Um, and it's also how the, the, the School of Resistance is based when we said, OK, why don't we meet in the, in the, in the, in the virtual space, people from different uh, continents, from different fields, etc., to talk about. And that's the point where perhaps I would uh, slightly contradict to, to, to Edouard to somehow totalize uh, the act we can do together. Because I think one big problem and, and somehow we went further in it and we somehow overcame it with new strategies is the fragmentation of our uh, of our work we do that if we are a teacher or a soldier or a, a, i don't know a scientist or a or a writer or a theater maker we are working in different fields and uh, i think what we should do and I'm, I'm talking now as an artist is trying to totalize the act of art and and here i come uh, back to i think what Joffre said in the very beginning of the discussions when he said not engaged art is impossible and we should highlight again everything what in bourgeois art is not very well seen. For example, that the concrete, the clear and the, I would even say the ideological that you say I do this work for this aim. <laughs> I want to highlight this and I do it to change this. I think it's very important when you want to be political in a, in a in a, in a real sense, to be very explicit. So I would say that's for me the first point, how to be activist in art is to be ideological and very concrete what your, what your aims are. The second thing is for me, against the fragmentation, I think collective work is really the way out of it. To focus on the process, on your network of knowledge, how you produce a work more than on a product that you say, fuck the product. I'm not interested in this kind of premieres and critiques and so on. Of course, you're somehow depending in the economic value of, of the work you do, that you have more this than, than that in the critique, but that you find ways and institutions and solidarities that the premiere is not valued anymore. That is about the process and you would value the, the process you have, the, the, the power of the process. And the, the last thing is, I think, against isolation that we should really try to do popular art. We should really try to have the biggest, the biggest impact possible. Um, and and, and um, I think that was one question you asked us in your, in your email preparing this discussion. What is about uh, a kind of a repertoire of resistance? Is there a kind of a... And because this, this is, is called, uh, I think, aesthetics of resistance, and it's not by accident that it is called like this, these discussions, because it's the title of a book by Peter Weiss. I don't even know if this, this book is, is known. It's very known here in, in Germany as a book, and it's a very interesting book, because actually it's a book, uh, a description of the struggle of the, of the working class through the description and the confrontation with big artworks from, I don't know, Delacroix, the, uh, Liberty Guiding the People, or Jericho, or Dante, or... 
and so on, a kind of a reappropriation of the classics by the working class or by the people that is only depicted in these images and by watching them, giving them a new interpretation and a new practice, it would become again a part of their real hidden history and forgotten history. And I think this for me is one outcome because I was also asking myself, why do I go back to the classics, the Bible and the... And, uh, and, uh, uh, I shall also and so on since, since some years now. Why am I interested in uh, and not creating kind of completely new stories? And I think this is also something we should start to focus on and it's perhaps a kind of a repetition of the socialist realism to revisit uh, somehow the classics in a new way and under the perspective of new, of new collectives. Now, perhaps, Geoffroy, what would you make of the, the notion of the repertoire in this sense? Because to many people, it is inherently conservative uh, to have a repertoire of works that perhaps requires prior knowledge often or prior, um, let's say, artistic practice, <laughs> or at least the practice to go as, a, as an audience member in order to know the finer points of the stories of how it came to be. Um, how do you relate to that notion? Well, um, it's it's hard for me to have the uh, same position like uh, Milo or Edouard because I'm not an artist and I don't have a real uh, important relation with art and with creation. I don't have a huge culture, to be honest. <laughs> I don't read a, a lot of literature or theater. I only read theory and philosophy and sociology. So this is my world and uh, this is my my my, my environment. Um, for me, what uh, when I when I know about the notion of repertoire of the classic, for me it would be the the point of departure of an interrogation about the the world of culture as a world of uh, terrorism, you know, of terror. You know, you always have to to accept the importance of some piece of art. You, you always have to recognize that I don't know Molière, Racine, Corneille, uh, I don't know Dante, and so on is important. And uh, Bourdieu has a very very important uh, idea. He says it's very hard in the world of art to uh, distinguish between uh, what people really think of a piece of art and uh, the fact that when they speak about art, they uh, voice the opinion they think is uh, legitimate or they think will uh, um, will um, will uh, 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 make them uh, look uh, pretty or smart or intelligent and you know in the world of art uh, there is no such thing as a, a real taste you know it is a world where you always anticipate uh, are people going to see me as a, a clever or of, of barbarian uh, am i going to be uh, seen as uh, ignorant or, or or with a huge culture. And uh, so the, the anticipation of the reception of what you say is so important in the world of art. And nothing is more uh, shameful in this world than to be with no culture, to say, I don't know this artist, I don't know this, uh, this writer, I don't know this piece. That in fact, the repertoire is, uh, is for me the, 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 the repetition of acts of terror by which we, we think we have to recognize the importance of the world, of, of the piece of art of the past. You know, and so I don't have any, uh, 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 I don't fetishize what, is, uh, what has been done. And so if, for example, when people would say we will never show any uh, piece of theater by Corneille now, I would not uh, have any problem with that. Uh, I would just do a, a small thing about what uh, Milo said, because you asked the first question about what, what are, would be the challenge of a, um, a, a leftist art. Uh, today, and he, he spoke about. Uh, I remember the, the 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 notion of the process. You know that is most important that the, the the first of the premiere. You know, and to put the process of the the core of the of the of the production of the of a, of a theater play. And I think indeed, uh, what on the tension of a, a politically um, motivated and ethical art today is a tension between. It's impossible to do art without uh, uh, taking into account the the apparatus into which you are inscribed when you produce art. And if you don't interrogate the, the form of the museum, of the form of the theater play, of the form of, uh, um, uh, uh, I don't know, a gallery, uh, you will be the, the, the victim of a system uh, you don't address. And so you will be part of this reproduction of this system, which is part of the system of cultural domination. So you have to interrogate in 
your 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 play or your art, uh, the, the apparatus of art. But the, the problem with that is when you do that, sometimes art becomes more and more about art, you know. And the 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 the, 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 the challenge for artists it's not to 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 transform art uh, as an art about art, an art about the process of art, which will in fact forget. Uh, the world forgets the, 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 the big questions, you know. And so I think one of the most important tensions or, 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 or challenges, in fact, for artists today is how to interrogate art in the process of producing art without uh, doing an art that is about art, you know. And I think that's one of the most important <laughs> issues. Now, Edouard, please feel free to react to other questions here and including the repertoire, but I was wondering in your case, because you have experience of two very different artistic processes from writing on the one hand, which is to an extent quite solitary, uh, and more recently working as part of, a, of an artistic team um, for a play and playing yourself in Who Killed My Father, directed by Thomas Ostermeyer. Um, how did you experience the difference between those two processes and did that shift your perspective on what we've been discussing? Uh, yeah, clearly uh, those two exercises were extremely different, being alone every day for two years and two or three years in, in writing your book or being every day with a team and discussing with people and also being confronted then when the show starts to, to the people every day uh, is something really, um, it's two completely different experience. And from that point, uh, there is something that theater has that literature don't have. Because literature, theater is, uh, as as we were talking about confrontation, uh, theater has a, a huge uh, confrontational power. You know, because you are mm -hmm. here in front of the people, in front of, of the people you are talking to, and they have their bodies in front of you, and they have to be confronted uh, to what you say. They can escape. They can, you know, like uh, uh, stand up and and walk out the room. But it's much more difficult uh, than just like closing the book and forgetting about it. And for me, this is what is beautiful in the, in the, in, in theater. It's like this suspension of liberty for, for, for a few minutes, for, for one hour, for, for one hour 30, that pushes you to, to really see what you are confronted to, to really see what the artist is confronting you to. And, um, you know, I was, I was, I very, very often quote this, this scene of, uh, um, of when I was a when I was a teenager, I was uh, I was a, a gay boy in the closet, and one day I went to see Angels in America in the theater. And uh, since my birth, I knew that I had desire for men, that I was gay, that I was attracted to men, but I was ashamed of it, and I I hated myself for that. And so I was trying to bury it, like inside me, as 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 deep as I as I could. And and one day I went to see with with high school uh, angels in America, and I saw those men like kissing and touching each other and like having sex on stage. And suddenly it was impossible to to not see what was going on. And I I I, I eventually stood up and walked out the room and I said I don't want to see that faggot things. Because, because I was closeted, because I had interiorized the homophobia of my father, of my milieu, of the, the hate of, of myself. But the fact that I, walk, I, I walked out was the, the evidence that it was already too late. And, uh, and for me, the theater really, really opens this possibility of con if we, if we uh, uh, as I was saying before yesterday, if we, if we consider that people already know how ugly the world is, they know how bad the world is, they know how violent the world is, but they don't want to see it. And the bourgeoisie is constantly building like physical strategies in order to turn their eyes, to turn their head, to never see it. Then theater is a particular place of, 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 of confrontation. And it really makes people mad. And, 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 and I felt that power that I had uh, on the on on the stage that I that I didn't necessarily uh, have uh, in the in the process of writing. So this is once again the opposite of what Sartre called the uh, art engagé, the committed art, because Sartre was saying we call the liberty of the reader, but I don't want to call the liberty of the reader or of the person in front of me because I know that if I give them the, this liberty, they will turn their head 
and escape what I'm saying and try to deny what I'm saying and to deny the reality we are presenting. The project is precisely the opposite, a suspension of liberty and not a suspension of liberty forever or not like a dictatorial moment, but like facing people to what they don't want to see, exactly like the boys that I was didn't want to see what it was. But the fact that it was suddenly uncomfortable, the, f the fact that I didn't feel good, the fact that I didn't feel safe, that led me to liberation. And that's why also uh, in the current American situation, political American situation in the side of the liberal, where everything, all the conversation is around like the idea of like feeling safe, uh, safe space, feeling comfortable, there are no revolutionary art possible because you, of course, achieve transformation only if you make people uncomfortable and only if you don't make people feel safe. And, and this is what the theater offers. If you just want people to be safe, it means that the bourgeoisie will be safe in its ugliness and it, in, its, in its reproduction of, of, of the ugly world. And uh, this, is, this is why I, I want to continue acting now and continue being on stage. And that's why I'm, I'm going to build this project with, with Milo uh, that we, are, uh, st we started to work on. And like this video is a little bit part of it, but uh, <laughs> we will try to find ways of, uh, of confrontation, of more and more confrontation. That was that was going to be my next question, because, of course, you two are working together at the moment. You want to tell us a little more about, first of all, what brought you together, perhaps, for a project and what you're working on at the moment? It's a love story. <laughs> 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 no, go, Milo. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm also searching. We have now a kind of I have the impression, huge complexes of discussion and of meetings and of ideas and we met from uh, from Berenice uh, until uh, I think making a film together with uh, Isabelle Huppert and uh, we had we had many ideas what we what we could do and of course one uh, idea for me always is is the necessity why exactly would you be at that moment uh, on stage so that's my my big question I have of course and I think it's it came from the necessity I, I remember from uh, from our not first discussion when we we said we, we want to do a project but one of the first ones and uh, and Edouard couldn't write because it was wrong what he was writing and he didn't know why and uh, I think even Geoffroy was saying it's a great text but he felt it's it's wrong or uh, you know and that you have somehow the feeling and I think the theater is the best place to feel it that you really feel in every moment if it's right or wrong or necessary what you are what you're doing. And I think it's very much linked to what we discussed now about uh, freedom and safety and purity and uh, all this kind of neoliberal mythological methodology where the, where the theater is, of course, uh, one of the main spaces of it. When you think about theater, you think, ah, I will be free and I will be safe and it will be tolerant and all antagonisms will be outside and everybody will love everybody. And uh, to find a place of complete <laughs> exposure, losing your own method methodology, how you want to perhaps present you, kind of... Because, I mean, listening to, to, to Geoffroy and Edouard, I understood that I think in this very moment, the myth of freedom in art and the myth of safety in art is completely linked to avoid revolution and change in any way. So that's what is... And that's why it's interesting for me, it was interesting to, to read this Racine-like uh, Mozart libretto in the last weeks when I was doing this opera, where you had mm. kind of this really closed space of the elitist rhetorics about tolerance that exists since, since hundreds of years in the very same way. I would even not link it to the bourgeoisie, it would just link it to the ruling class, actually. So there were always good leaders with open spaces and safe spaces and so on. So, and I think to destroy these spaces of freedom, you can't leave. I call it sometimes a Stalinist space, the theater. You can't leave, you have to stay until the end. I remember I was in a play by, by uh, Luc Perceval, like a director who is working in my, in my place in End Again too. 10 years ago when he became famous, I was in the first row um, and I made the mistake that I was drinking two big beers before going to the premiere. And after 10 minutes, I, I had to go to the toilet. But because it's theater, it's impossible. You can't leave. I was in the middle of the row. 
And I was suffering like a, like a dog for three hours. And I was thinking I will die. But this for me, this, this, it seems a bit absurd and it's of course a coincidence. But uh, for me, this is what I want to achieve somehow. That you would be physically completely present. You can't escape to the situation. You're confronted to whatever. I, m many times I'm think, I start to, when I'm listening to somebody, I start to to think parallelly. It's not that the, the myth of intention is also very wrong. Even boredom, even that you have the possibility to think something else while you are watching, for me in theatre is very important. That you have this space where you are still kind of free, but you are locked. And, uh, and I think exploring <laughs> this space, we also call it a bit histoire du théâtre. Of course, it will be mm -hmm. also a, an investigation on... on uh, on, on what role played theatre in our lives. In, in Edouard's life, he, he mentioned this uh, Angels of America moment, for example. In my life, what are the different values of, 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 this, this, uh, yeah, of these methods to be together in one room so, and so on. So that's, uh, uh, that's uh, but much more we don't know. I think over next week we really start um, and we write this text. To be continued for perhaps yeah. to see that either in the coming seasons, but I'm, I'd be curious to know how you create the conditions for that practice to happen, for that process to happen, because of course there is what happens in the creation process itself, but there is also the working conditions behind for the people you're working with, for the collective. Is that something that you consider uh, that you considered, for instance, when you took over an institution like Entegens? how to create the conditions for people to do their best work and hopefully make the place you're working in as fair as possible and as representative of what you'd like to see in society as possible. I, I, I will, I, because you are mentioning uh, Entegent, I will just, uh, mm -hmm. I will add. For me, again, being explicit is very important. I mean, you can, uh, you can tell whatever you want, but politics means that you have, a, for example, a manifesto and there are written the rules and everybody who enters that space will know the rules and you can be measured. You can say, but you did this and you said you want this and here it's written. So I think this is very, again, it's a bit Stalinist, but it's very important that everybody, for me, knows what are these conditions you describe. And what we try mm -hmm. to do, and now we are reformulating the Ghent Manifesto, of course, again and again, uh, to make these rules <laughs> known to everybody. Another point for me important is, we can uh, discuss this, Edouard, but normally all my rehearsals are open to public. There is always somebody present. Now it's a bit difficult because of, of, uh, of COVID. But for example, that this, this discussion is, is open to everybody who wants to join, perhaps 50 people or 200 people or 5,000 people, but everybody who wants can listen and can even leave a comment. And I think this is a, I mean, it's, it seems superficial. And of course, then you have all the regulations that you would give to a, to a project and that you would learn step by step. And every project is, a, um, is quite, quite different. For example, I have many rules I normally use. I don't adapt to the project with Edouard because it's, it's a monologue. So different languages or non-professionals or etc. makes not so much sense. <laughs> if not, it's already mixed in, in, in Edouard himself. But uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's for me, being explicit is the point, actually. Mm -hmm. That was Geoffroy, if you want to comment on that, but I, I was thinking that you that you write about the ways in which institutions, by their very existence in many ways, sort of keep reproducing kind of exclusivity for the audience. Um, do you think, what are the conditions under which you think institutions, public institutions, can actually start creating more, the conditions for popular arts to thrive and reach its audience? Well, it's a, indeed, it's a very hard question because uh, the, the problem with art is that there is always a very big difference because what people think they are doing and what they objectively do, you know. Uh, 
And mm. uh, the problem with art is that mm. very often, for example, people think they are going, uh, they are doing a, a piece of art that is open because there, there will be no guide, because there will be no explanation, because it will be spontaneous. Mm. And in fact, when you are a sociologist, you know it's the art that is the most intimidated in the social world because uh, popular classes need the code to understand. Mm. They need to feel uh, uh, um, guided, you know, because they know nothing. And so at the end, when you think you do something which is open, it's free, there is no rule, you can do whatever you want in the space of the museum. In fact, you have the most uh, elite bourgeoisie inside the exposition and the popular classes, they feel completely excluded by it. So in fact, uh, and I think that's true, if you want to transform uh, art into popular art, if you want to do an art that would be able to circulate into a different kind of public sphere. In fact, you have to change the school system too. You have to change the, the habitus and the way uh, people see art, how they learn, how to behave. And the simple fact to sit in a theater and to see something and to wait two hours uh, requires uh, years and years of domestication of your body in order just to be able to sit and to, sh to shut and, you know, and not to move, uh, which is already uh, a selective process, you know. When, when Milo was talking about his experience with beer and uh, the urge to pee inside of, uh, in front of <laughs> a piece of art, I was thinking in the political theory, you know, we have exactly the opposite idea that uh, uh, the, 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 the possibility for a, gov a government to be good is when it opens the possibility for people to, to flee or to go away. You know, you have mm -hmm. this theory, liberal theory of libertarian theory, that the, the possibility to exit a society uh, is the most powerful uh, um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, tool to force government to be good because if they are not good, people will leave and they will have, no, they will have nobody to, 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 to submit to their power, you know? So, and for me, for example, when I go to a theater play, I always dream of a system where you could escape the play by going um, uh, uh, under your, your seat, you know, and disappear in where the, you, you hate the piece, you know? And I think the people in theater would do much better play if they knew everybody could uh, disappear at uh, about 10 minutes after it began because it's, it's too awful, you know? And when you write a book, you, you, this question is a very, very good question because you know that people can close your book and say, okay, it's boring, I don't read it anymore. Yeah, yeah. And so there All is right. this right to exit. Yeah. Yes, there, there is this right to exit which is in fact uh, a question that you should you have to address when you are a writer and sometimes people in opera or dance or theater they know they are they yeah. are taking people to a stage and they are too violent with the public violent in the sense that they are too bad because they don't have this fear that people will leave and so i think that for me the <laughs> in fact I, I don't agree with your, with your ethics of uh, off stage <laughs> and i prefer an ethics of uh, letting people free to to go but um yeah i don't know if i answered the question but i think just to address the question of the school system is very important to mm -hmm. transform culture you know As a, you cannot transform culture with an autonomous cultural practice you know it's too it's too linked to class society, to to to, to school system, to to uh, uh, the, the people who are the possibility to to just uh, take a distance from uh, the daily life and people who are emerged in necessity, you know. And so you cannot change art if you don't change a society, economic structure, and the, the school system. Now, Edouard, I was going to ask you, I was worried that people were going to flee when you when you stepped on stage last year, but perhaps more generally as well. Uh, I, I know that I suppose the, the, the tour of the of the production was not as, as extensive as it was planned because of the pandemic, but from your experience of being on stage so far, do you find that the reactions that you get from people, uh, whether it's in writing or just after a performance, the discussions that you have are different in nature from the reactions that you get after publishing a book? No, not really. I would say that uh, mm. the, the conversations that I have after performing on stage or after like a, a public discussion about the book are pretty much the same. And mm. uh, it's, mostly about, um, it's mostly about making people talk making people talk about them, making people talk about themselves, making people understand that they are part of, of you know, like of, of, of a society with its violent mm -hmm. mechanisms that we don't necessarily and always see, that they are part of, you know, groups that uh, endure a certain uh, social mechanism that uh, make them uh, fragile or pre uh, uh, precarious and everything. And this is for me really to, this is the this is the goal of, of of what I do when I do art. It's to it's to make people it's to make people speak. It's to make people talk, 
And as Geoffroy say, even if I disagree with him also a little bit, and also what he just said is also framed by the fact that he doesn't like art, so he always wants to escape. <laughs> and uh, he's my closer <laughs> friend, so I know I gave, I, I offered him so many novels that I love so much, like uh, Claude Simon or uh, James Baldwin <laughs> or Simon de Beauvoir that he never wants to read because he reads so much <laughs> philosophy all the time and it takes all the space in his life. Um, <laughs> But uh, but but the, the thing is, um, what is true in what Geoffroy says is that, of course, and we, we know it, the, 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 the system of art is based on a system of exclusion and who have access mm -hmm. to it and who have, don't, don't have access to it and, and who can talk about it and who can feel silent, who is silent by, by, by the arts. You know, you don't understand, you are not able to understand, you will not understand, like is most of the... A, a, a huge part of the contemporary uh, uh, um, um, art of, of the of the modern art, you know, which when working class people go, they don't understand anything. They don't have any keys to understand. They don't have the frame to understand, and then they feel completely excluded. So, in the in terms of explicit, what would be an art that don't reduce people to silence, but that would make them talk, you know? And uh, when 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 Simone de Beauvoir published the Second Sex. Uh, about uh, women, she says in the memoirs that suddenly she got hundreds of letters from women saying, I had this experience with my uh, husband, I had this experience in my life, I was subjected to a certain role during my whole life. And in the past, I didn't know it. People were living next to their life and they didn't have the, uh, even the ability to say I, you know. And for me also, a radical piece of art is a, is a, is a, is a is, is a piece of art that gives this possibility to the people to say I. I never understand the people who say that we live in a too individualist society where everyone wants to say I, where everyone wants to talk about themselves, where everyone... I don't see it anywhere. I just see people who, for whom it's so difficult to say hi, to say I am a person I had suffered through, like all the working class in people in my childhood, for them it was almost impossible to say I am someone, I experience something. And so it's a, a problem of the bourgeoisie, once again, to think that too many people say hi. And also that's why I think that the autobiographical art is also an art of resistance today in the present, because it's suddenly so many people who didn't have access to, to, to this first person speech who make it and suddenly give the possibility to other people to make it. And that's why, for example, the rap music is a deeply autobiographical art because it's mostly people who are excluded from the legitimate field of art who suddenly take a speech, take the power, and they say I, and it gives the possibility to, to other people to understand that they are also I, that they are subject, that they... And so this is really the experience that I'm trying to, to, to create if, if, I, if I'm clear. It's never easy to be clear on Zoom. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> or on, on I don't know what's the app. <laughs> <laughs> it was very clear. I think we're nearing the end of our time together, um, so we'll have to leave it here. But I just want to say thank you to anyone who followed, whether you followed over the past three days or you just tuned in today. I hope you got something out of this conversation and that you'll keep following along. For I think you have a conversation around the Revolt of Dignity at 5 p.m. as well and the new gospel the film inspired by the Bible that we discussed briefly in our conversations by Milo Rao. Um, you thank you to Edouard Louis, to Geoffroy de la Gannerie, and of course to Milo Rao for being with Thank me so and allowing much, me to have Thank you so much. Thank you, Laura, for moderating. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, so so much. <laughs> Thank you very much. And see you all of you very Thank soon. You. Huh? Or Thank you. Or the next days. So yes. Thank you. Exactly. <laughs> Bye. And write Bye. confrontational art. <laughs> yes. <laughs> next week it starts. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye. So I have to go to pee, actually. <laughs>